It must have been a blast to have been one of Pascal's drinking buddies. He, he would have been so easy to fuck with. You say, hey, Blaze, if you take a piss before 5 a.m., a dragon is going to come out of your dick hole and eat you. And then he just has to hold it all night. You know, because, sure, the odds that you're right are super low, but what if you are? I mean, the discomfort of holding in your piss all night is nothing compared to being eaten by a freshly urinated dick dragon, so he just doesn't get to pee, right? It's, it's, it's just amazing to me how quick theists are to offer up explanations for their beliefs that wouldn't pass muster for any other proposition. Because, look, man-eating urethra dragons are actually inherently more likely than God. You know, at least the dragon doesn't hold mutually exclusive properties. So if you actually wanted to use Pascal's wager as an epistemological principle, you'd have to think, well, I'm pretty sure there's no goblins in the kitchen, but what if I'm wrong? I better bring the battle axe just in case, and, and there's no logical reason to think that this rainwater is going to make me explode, but I better stay in, inside just in case I'm wrong. And well, I don't think that the TV is going to turn into a giant poisonous wasp, but I better smash the shit out of it just to be on the safe side, right? And yet, despite its obvious absurdity, Christians and other various theists will offer this as a justification for their most cherished belief without even a hint of embarrassment. What if you're wrong? What, like you determined that there was an omnipotent dude cataloging your sexual positions who's going to give you a fucking golden space mansion when you die because not getting a space mansion would suck? How can this strike anyone as a valid argument? And, you know, it's not like I've just picked out their worst argument. I use Pascal's wager because it's the one I hear most often, but all of their arguments are equally vapid. They'll say, well, where did the Big Bang come from? And I'll say, a gay dragon that wants you to give me money. And they'll say, nah. -uh. And I'll say, well, what if you're wrong? And they won't give me money. So clearly, they're not even buying their own bullshit here. You know, they'll, they'll say, I had a personal experience with God. And I said, well, you know, I had a personal revelation that you could drink this whole gallon of bleach and you'd be able to see into the future. And they still won't drink the bleach. Or they'll say, you know, God gives my life meaning. And I'll say, you know what, slapping people who say that in the head with my dick gives my life meaning and they still won't hold still. So again, they wouldn't accept any of these arguments for any other proposition and yet they're willing to use them to justify what they consider to be the most important thing a person could possibly know. No. So the obvious question is, how do intelligent people get fooled into thinking that these are valid arguments? I mean, it, it doesn't take an intellectual powerhouse to knock down virtually anything the apologists have to offer. And while some of the religious people are no doubt stupid enough to think that these arguments add up, the vast majority of them aren't. I mean, even most of the stupid theists would see through Pascal's wager if you used it to prop up something other than God. So how does this happen? Well, the obvious answer is that they're not buying their own bullshit, that they don't believe themselves. Now, that's not a controversial answer, by the way. It's just a controversial way of phrasing the answer, because most people call it compartmentalization. I guess that's because they don't want to say actively lying to yourself and pretending to be convinced by things that you don't find convincing. But the one thing means the other. If you're putting certain questions in a logic-free zone in your mind, it's because you've already admitted that they wouldn't make it if they were in any other zone. And if that's the case, then on some level, you've also admitted that you don't believe what you're professing to believe. Why else would you compartmentalize it? And when you consider it, this explains an awful lot. After all, if religious people actually believed what they were saying, you'd never catch any of them crying at a funeral or making any active effort to avoid dying. And yet when their mothers die, regardless of how saintly their mothers are, they know that they're never going to see them again. You know, when their children die or when their spouses die, they know it's over. They act like they know it's over. They react in the same way the atheists react, with the exact same amount of sadness and finality, which says to me that when the chips are down, nobody believes in God. You know, I recall a phenomenon from back in my hippy-dippy spiritualism days. We'd do these elaborate ceremonies. You'd have these you know, color-coded candles and a circle of salt and consecrated elemental weapons and robes that we've made by hand and prescribed mixes of incense and elaborate gestures and chants and shit. And sometimes weeks of preparation would go into this shit. And then after all this preparation and practice and all this intricate ritual shit, nothing would happen. Invariably. Exactly the same outcome every time we did it. But that's when that compartmentalization thing kicked in, right? Because we didn't stand around afterwards and say, huh, Nothing happened again. Instead, we'd all kind of talk ourselves into believing that something did happen. You know, the, the most credulous person in the circle would say, well, I know I felt a presence, and 
you know, nobody can just call bullshit on them because we're all pretending that this could have worked. So you can't argue when somebody said that it did. And then, you know, nobody wants that person to be the only one who got to tap into the magic tonight. So the next thing you know, somebody else also felt the presence and somebody else saw a vague outline of a demon in the incense smoking. And, and, and somebody else saw that exact same thing, too, except for far more clearly. And then somebody else heard it speak. And then suddenly within 10 fucking minutes of the end of this thing, we've turned this failure into a success. Now, keep in mind, nobody ever actually said the words, hey, let's all pretend that worked, huh? It was just an unspoken agreement. And sure, you knew you were lying when you said you saw the demon, but you didn't know for sure that everybody else was lying, even though you pretty much knew it. But, you know, maybe something really did happen, and you just weren't tuned in enough. So, so better do another ritual and be more tuned in next time. You know, the point is that from my perspective, looking back on it now, I never believed it, and I knew the whole time that I didn't. I did admit that out loud, and in a sense, I didn't even admit it to myself. But I couldn't fool me by refusing to think the specific words, this is bullshit. I knew it was a lie every time I told it. Now, I, I can't say how many religious people are in this same position, but, you know, look, if I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, respecting their intelligence, and judging by their actions... I'd have to say all of them.